I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, and then you're going to end up flipping over to Matthew 14. So if you're one of those people that likes to be hyperly prepared, you want to like go to Matthew 14, put your thumb in your Bible and then go. If you're one of those people, get a smartphone. You just click a button and you just zap over. You don't have to do the thumb thing. It's like brilliant. It's awesome. No, if you're a person that likes to be prepared, that's cool. You guys remember sword drills? I mean, you grew up with sword drills. Just curious what kind of crowd you have. Good. Good. Most of you. Uh, some of you. I don't know. That was probably half. And I said most of you which is the wrong percentage for that. Sword drill is when you were in some sort of a Bible class in Sunday school or a Christian school and everyone would hold their Bibles up above their head and the the pastor or the teacher would yell out a verse and you would bring the Bible down and you would get to it as quickly as you possibly can. Uh, I tore a few pages of the Bible and felt like I was sacrilegious trying to beat my friends to a Bible verse. So I don't really recommend it for today. But it was an awesome thing. And what was cool about that, when I was a Bible class teacher and I had high schoolers that were doing that, I like to give a reward for that. Like maybe you give them like a, a quiz they don't have to take or, you know, something forever wins. And so as a result of that, it was competitive, right? It was like a big deal. And what would happen is you'd have a class like this size that's in here. Well, it's not that big. But you'd have people all over the place and they would end up uh, finding it and throwing their hands up at the same time. I didn't mean to create this kind of disunity, but literally then people would begin to argue about whose hand went up first. How you solve that as a teacher. You have them like put their hands down again and then raise, and they have to do it again, which is a perfect tie every time once you're there. Uh, so it was, it was a difficult thing, but what I did is I just simply kept my eyes on the class really well. You learn the students that get there first, and you kind of like, you know, you corner your eye like, yeah, it's probably going to be that guy. Name is John, and you know there's something blessed about being that name. So you know, I would just kind of, I, I would do it that when I would figure it out. And so keeping your eyes locked on the class is the way to figure that out, right? And I think we have a problem in this world with the idea of keeping our eyes locked where they should be. It's somewhat natural. It, it's somewhat automatic because we're inundated with things to look at. I mean, I literally have been watching TV, not hungry at all. A commercial pops up, I'm hungry. For, for whatever is being advertised there, right? It's just a normal thing. And if you lock your eyes on the wrong things, your life is going to be affected by that greatly. And if you lock your eyes on the right things, your life will be affected by that greatly. And so I want to talk about that a little bit. And first here in Hebrews chapter 10, uh, I'm going to read in verse 24. It'll be on the screen for you as well. And I'm going to read it out of the NLT. Uh, it's a modern version that does some great things and the way it translates things. But here's what it says. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. There's just no way to misunderstand that verse, is it? Let us think of ways that we can motivate each other. I love the King James. It actually says provoke one another to good works and love. That sounds pretty Christian to me. I love the idea of, of spending my life doing that. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. That the closer and closer we get to Jesus coming back, the more and more we're going to need encouragement, the more and more we're going to need to provoke other people to acts of love and to acts that are good works. And I think of that through the, through the illustration of Ripple. So you can go ahead and go to Matthew uh, 14 if you want. But if you've ever been by any type of still water and then you had to break the stillness, you had to break the peace, so you pick something up and you throw it in. As like a kid, you usually try to find the heaviest thing and then when you throw it, it doesn't get there and it like sticks in the mud before it gets in the water. Better to just get a big rock and throw it in. But if you've ever seen that happen, you see the ripples, right? They go out for a while and then they stop. But you see the ripples and the effects of that. And one of the things I think we miss in our Christian walk is, is a single act of love or a single good work that you do in this world has ripples to it. It affects the people who are around you every day. You can create ripples in your home. It affects the people that you work with. It affects the people that you're out and about with. Everything we do has the opportunity to create ripples. So ripples become a neutral thing. You can send out good ones. You can send out bad ones. And I think it's very important for us to acknowledge this idea. So maybe you think Jesus isn't going to come back in your time. I'm fine with that. But I can tell you it's absolutely true that today we are closer to his return than we were yesterday. That's just a fact. So today we have a greater need to motivate each other to love and good works. We have a greater need to encourage each other than we did yesterday. Every day it's compounding, isn't it? I mean, all you got to do is look at our world. This was written thousands of years ago. 
And we desperately need people in our world who are doing good works, who are showing acts of love, and who are encouraging the people that are around them. And so I want to help you do that. I read an old story last week. Uh, we were in staff meeting, and this happens sometimes. Or uh, Pastor Lance and Pastor Chris and I will be in a room, and we'll be talking about other things that are going on. We'll share a devotion or something like that. And Chris said something that just jumped out to me. And when, when some sort of a truth jumps out to me, and my mind starts thinking about all these verses that support it, uh, I'll often research it. So what I'm basically telling you is that they write my sermons. That's basically what I'm telling you. And, uh, and so he just said something about keeping your eyes locked on God, how you don't want to unlock them, how you don't want to stop thinking what it does to you when you keep your eyes where they should be with him. And uh, so immediately the story of, of Peter, which is where we're at in Matthew chapter 14, jumped out to me. But before we get there, I have a confession I need to make. I was an idiot as a child. Yeah, the people laugh, think they weren't idiots. And the rest of you that didn't laugh, you all know you were an idiot as a child as well. And so thank you for that camaraderie. I appreciate it. No, I seriously was. And uh, so I need to share this kind of through a timeline thing. So I was rolling over early. I think I was one and a half, two months old. And my mom put me on the counter after bathing me in a sink. And you know that sink was yellowish. And that that countertop was probably yellowish. I mean, you can, you, this is in the 70s. So go back. And on the wall that was like a off-white, there was a yellow phone. Some of you don't realize this, but phones used to hang on walls. And they had cords that went from the phone into the receiver of the phone. Go to a museum, you'll be able to check these out. And you press buttons. This wasn't a button phone. This was a rotary. So you like did this dial thing. It was so fun. Just go... And you had to dial zero for an operator in an emergency situation. Zero was the biggest thing you had to I don't know why they did that. But you would be like zero. You die here. The family dies here. Operator, can I help you? I mean, that was, that was the day and age. So my mom asked me on the counter. She had bathed me. Uh, and I was so young, she just thought there would be no big deal. I'm on this counter, maybe three feet tall. The phone rings, and she does this to grab the phone. And she told me that as her hand hit the phone, one, two seconds, she heard me thud on the ground. I immediately rolled over, and I went face first, which is what's wrong with this, face first <laughs> into the ground. And I guess mom you know, picked me up, and I bawled the rest of the day. And I'm like, yeah, your fault. I mean... <laughs> When I was two, my dad was tarring the driveway. We were in Florida, and he was tarring his driveway or someone's driveway, and I decided it'd be cool to climb into the bucket of tar. When I was four, I was running around my house, and uh, many of you don't realize this, but furniture makers used to hate children, and there's been a revival since, since that time, but coffee tables were sharpened at the corner. Like, I literally think they would take, like, and then they painted it to make it look like it wasn't. My brother and I were running somewhere. I tripped and I came within a half inch of losing an eye. And I literally cut through my eyelid and hit the bone behind it. Um, you can see the scar if you really look for it now. Um, it's a coffee table. When I was riding a bike and I decided that I was too cool for training wheels, I broke them off. Like you, know, you could just bend them up and if you bend them back and forth enough times, they snapped off. I decided to go down this big hill with my brother and his friends. My brother's uh, three years older than me. So that was occurring. And as I picked up speed and didn't know how to stop, this was in the day where the, where the, the bicycle thing wasn't free. So like you literally, the way you hit your brakes is you just push backwards. So if this is moving, your feet have to move with it, right? I took my feet off. Because it was moving too fast. I thought, well, that would be smart. I don't know how fast it was going, 35, 40 miles an hour. I, probably not that fast. I decided the way to rescue myself was to jump off of the bike. Oh. Made sense at the time. Until I landed on my knees and my elbows and scraped all the skin off and went to the emergency room. And my mom said that I was a bloody mess, and I believe it. So when I was sledding uh, one day, I, I decided that I was going to be cool. Uh, I was old enough. I wasn't old, old. Like, I wasn't a teenager yet or probably even a tweener yet. But I had recognized that there was an opposite sex and that I wanted to show off for them. I was a baby in my family. Babies of the world unite. Every opportunity that you get to show off, that's why you were born. I'm just saying so I decided not to slide the regular hill. I went the other hill and had to jump. I hit the jump. I put my left hand out as the sled flew that way. I landed on my left hand, and my left hand hit a rock right about here in my arm, and it broke both bones. And so when I came up, like, like how your wrist hangs like that, it was doing that like right here. It was really cool. It was really cool. Four doctors. I don't know the method, but I'll never forget this. A doctor put a shot in it, which I think the shot hurt as bad as breaking it did. He grabbed my arm 
And literally three other men, three other doctors stood behind him. Like, you don't have like a machine for this or something? And pulled on my arm until the bones that were like that snapped and came back into place. So that happened. Uh, when I was a tweener, I played uh, baseball with an aluminum bat and basketball. And instead of it being out here, it was right here. And I swing and hit the basketball. And that bat came back and hit me much harder than I hit the basketball. There's a lot of blood in my stories. I'm sorry if you're squeamish, but that, I mean, the forehead is a gusher. And when I was a freshman in high school, I decided I wanted to be able to dunk, but I wasn't able to even touch the rim. And so we set up mats in my gym, and I was dunking off these mats. And I dunked on the rim, and my legs kind of hung out because I hung on it. And when it was about vertical 10 feet, I let go of the rim, which was not a good decision. And I fell down, I broke both arms. And so for however many weeks that was, I had two casts on as a freshman in high school, which I am still scarred to this day from some of the things that happened during that time like teachers writing tests for me. Look, the reason I'm sharing this with you is I admit that I'm an idiot child, but why wasn't someone watching me? You know what I'm saying? Like, I blame my family, my mom, my dad, my brother. They knew I climbed into a bucket of tar when I was two years old. And then they still let me ride bikes and go sledding, and, and I don't know what's wrong in that picture. But the idea of keeping your eyes locked on something is a powerful idea. And the idea of taking your eyes off of something is a powerful idea. It swings both ways. I think sometimes we hear things that motivate us to Christian living and we get into that idea of Christian living and we almost think of it as like a, like a temporary thing. Like, okay, so I've got Monday through Sunday coming up and if I do what I heard Sunday at church, maybe I'll do it Monday afternoon and Thursday night and Saturday morning. And I'm a great Christian, right? Right? I mean, I heard this message and it said, do this, and I, I'm going to do it Monday afternoon. And I don't remember the order I said, but I'm going to do it a few times in this next coming week. And, and God is always, he's always present. He's always watching you. He's always looking for his relationship with you. He's always there for you. God is wanting to do something in an always way for you. So when I talk about keeping your eyes locked on God, this is an always thing. This is something you should be doing every single moment of every day. And you're going to need it more and more. You'll need it more tomorrow than you need it today. And you'll need it more next year, believe it or not, than you do in 2020. I mean, the Bible does not paint the picture of the world becoming a utopia and then Jesus comes back. The Bible paints the picture of the world's going to do what the world does and Jesus is going to be steady and true and be the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so our hope can't be found in anything in this world, because that will fail you. Your happiness can't be found in anything in this world, that will fail you. But the things God is doing for you and in you, every good gift, every perfect gift, and that relationship is really powerful when you keep your eyes locked on Him every day, which is what Peter needed here in Matthew 14. So we're going to be Matthew 14, read verse 22 through verse 33, and it'll be on the screen if you need it. Starts out this way, and straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side where he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves for the winds. Uh, the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. And they cried out for fear. But straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. And when he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. Beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. And he said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were come into the ship, the wind ceased. And then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. The walking on water thing finally revealed him. Now, if you're new to church, if you're new to, to being in church, if you're watching online and someone invited you and you're just searching for some things, that is awesome. This is one of the most familiar 
stories in Scripture. Peter walking on the water. And all sorts of things are taught from it. There's so many different applications. I don't know how many times I've read this story. But I get excited when I read it. And God has something jump out that maybe hasn't before. It isn't new. It isn't something that wasn't always there. It's just sometimes you get a new realization of what's going on. I think it's important in passages like this to kind of break it down. And for those of you that are maybe new to your faith, Jesus came and said, I am the Son of God. Jesus said over and over to his disciples that he was going to die, he was going to be buried, and he was going to rise again from the grave. Over and over, he said things like, I have come to redeem people. I have come so that sinners might be saved. I have come because I am the only way, the only truth, the only life. No one will come to the Father except through me. I mean, Jesus' claims are absolute. That the only way for us to be saved is through Jesus Christ, through God's Son, who paid that price on the cross for us. And the disciples blew it over and over. Thank God for Peter, because you won't feel so bad about yourself when you recognize how messed up he was. I mean, that's an important thing to recognize. God is pursuing us. And there isn't anyone in this world that isn't, there isn't anyone in this world too evil and too sinful that Jesus' blood can't save them, forgive them, and change them. Because it's just who Jesus is. And so if you don't know that, invitations are weird right now. It's hard to have people come to an altar when we're supposed to be spreading apart. But if you don't know the Lord is your Savior, there is nothing I would enjoy more in this next week. Meeting with you and talking with you about it. I, I can't make you get saved. I'm not that guy. I don't push. But I love to share the truth and answer questions from Scripture. So online here, please let... Uh, just come to me and let me know if that's the case. But I want to kind of go through this story, and it mostly is going to apply to Christians. Because looking unto God as your Savior, looking unto God once He's your Father, is an essential thing for we who want to make ripples in our life for Him. So in verse 22, it's important to recognize this. God intentionally, Jesus intentionally sent them into this storm alone. I mean, the Bible just flat out says that, right? And straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him to the other side. I don't know how often we recognize that. Like, is God allowed to send you into a storm? Like, just in your own life, in your own thinking, the way that you interpret it, is God allowed to send you into a storm? Because there's teaching out there that says, no, God's only allowed to do good in your life. He loves you so much, he'll only do good in your life. I love my kids so much, I don't just let them eat the good things they want to eat. Because there's good things that don't taste good. And we don't always define good very well. But if God caused it, then he is going to work it for good. If it hasn't become good yet, God's not done with it then. He works all things together for good to those who love him and those that he loves. I mean, that's, that's just who he is. And so God's allowed to send you into a storm. But I think sometimes we live our lives thinking he's not. And then the storm hits and we take our eyes off of him because God must have not known the storm was coming. And if he didn't know the storm was coming and he didn't spare me from getting into it, then maybe I need to take my eyes somewhere else and figure out how to solve my own problems. And it's in the midst of the storm that it's the most important time for you to lock your eyes on him. So I just want to ask you, what are you locking your eyes on? Everyone in this room is going through a storm. Our world is going through a storm. There's got to be something you're dealing with. You know the people that you wish they would hurry up and cheer up and stop being so grouchy? Have a reason to be grouchy, right? I mean, we ought to at least have a little bit of compassion on the people that are around us. My spouse hasn't been treating me so well. Well, the world hasn't been treating your spouse so well. Maybe it's time to up the love. Maybe it's time for you to get your eyes locked on God so that you can be the catalyst in your home to bring that love and good works in. My kids are grouchy all the time and they're they're bored to death. Kids love entertainment. If it's the baby of the family, yeah, watch out for that one. Trying to show off, wanting to show off, has no one to show off to. Just saying, it messes with you if you're the baby. The NLT says that Jesus insisted that they go. He literally did. Hey, I want you guys on a boat. I want you out in the middle of the ocean. I want you in the storm that is coming. And I want myself not to be there. Look, when you find yourself in that spot, you're in a storm. And and, and it's not one that you just brought upon yourself. Because we do bring some of them upon ourselves. But you're in a storm. Maybe keep your eyes locked on God. Maybe just stop and say, God might be doing this. Maybe he wants to show me something. Maybe he has a plan. Maybe he's going to solve this thing that I'm dealing with. Maybe he's drawing me closer to him. Maybe he's given me an opportunity for faith. There is always hope for a person who knows God. I was talking with Ellie the other day, and she was at work at Dunn Brothers, serving coffee. 
We have some fun phrases coming, like found people, find people is a big phrase here. Found people, find coffee as well, you know, because it's kind of a thing. So she's at work, and she's talking to a couple of coworkers, and they're talking to her about different things. And one of them literally said something like, so you really believe that the ark happened, and like they marched animals two by two into the ark? And, and she gave the preacher's daughter's answer. Yes, she does. And she believes it because she believes it. As we're sitting there thinking, I'm like, you know, the, all the little tiny debate stuff that people go through. If you believe there's an all-powerful God who has always existed and he spoke stars into being, do you know that out there there are star incubators? There are heavenly bodies that literally create stars and spit them out. Like that's not fairy tale, that's science. NASA will tell you that's true. God spoke and that thing was there because he spoke it. So if you believe in that, of course, of course he can. Allie gave a great answer. She was like, well, look at Zeus. Human beings can catch animals and put them in a cage. And I'm like, very true. But in this case, that wasn't even needed. Noah was busy building the boat, right? And God just marched him up and in there. It's interesting to me to, to, to see the difference that our faith should make when our eyes are locked on God. You have an all-powerful God that can do anything. And that's enough to be like, yeah, I'm going to translate what I'm going through in life differently. It doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It doesn't mean it isn't scary. You just translate it differently. In verse 23, Jesus sets an awesome example. And before we move on, we've got to dive into this. Jesus chooses alone time with his father. Not only does he send everybody else away, but then he goes up into a mountain to get alone by himself. The Bible tells us that later on, he is up there all alone, right? And you need alone time with your maker. You need time just between him and just between you. And if you're not getting that time, then I promise you, you're having trouble keeping your eyes locked on. Because it's that time with him that you get to recognize and absorb the fact that he is who he said he is. So when we're traveling, I love bathrooms. I can't, I, I know everyone else in this room is like, ah, oh, that's probably where, no, I'm not going to say that. You know, the, the, the restrooms that you stop at are always 50-50. Like, it just doesn't matter. We went to California to see my grandson Griffin, who is the most awesomest thing ever. Um, and so we went and saw him, and then we drove back like 26 hours on the road, Right? And, and we have girls on the trip, so you're going to stop and use the bathroom a lot, right? Is that is that misogynistic? I'm sorry. I also use the bathroom. But not as often. I, maybe I just have a big bladder. Or maybe all guys do. I'm going to stick to it. Ladies go more than guys on long trips. No one is leaving. No one's leaving. Marla, I got you. I believe that about you. But, but I'm just saying no one's leaving. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. When I go to a restroom, regardless of the level of filth, right? That's how you describe it. There's no clean one. It's what's the level of filth? Completely filth? Somewhat filth? No filth? If it's completely filth, you leave. If there's no filth, that means your eyes can't see it, run. You know what I'm saying? Something really wrong is going on there. But when I go to those places, so many of them are like you go in and there's, there's room for you. You lock the door behind you, right? It's not like this big, huge, you know, truck stop and there's showers. And all. Most of our stops are some little dinky, we were almost ready to run out of gas, so we stopped. And, you know, we, we were hoping not to be murdered. Most of our stops are like that. And I go into that bathroom, and I'm sorry, every single time I go in there, I think to myself, God, you're even here. I, like, become Google Earth. And I see this like satellite view of the world and it focuses into where I am, to the state, to the state I'm in, to that bathroom. And I think, God, you're even here. It's just crazy that you're here in this space that I didn't know existed. I might vote to say it shouldn't exist and you're right here with me. And it amazes me. And you get that from your alone time with him. So I just want to ask, are you magnifying what God wants you to magnify? Like, what are you doing with your time? Because your time is magnifying something. Be sure easy to magnify the news right now. And just be easy to magnify it. I'm not getting on you about it at all. The news is everywhere. Be easy to magnify that in your life. It'd be easy to magnify politics. It'd be easy to magnify economic challenges. It would be easy to magnify the bitter spirit that's existing in people that are around us. Like, you, you can magnify that. I get why people are magnifying that. But I think it's important to say, are we magnifying what God wants us to magnify? The other thought I think is just a, a big deal here is we need to pause in order to prioritize. If you're that human doing and you just keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you don't stop and be a human being, I mean, the Bible says, be still and know that I am God. 
It's not the only way to know him. That's a misrepresentation of the verse. But when you are still to know that he is God, that's a big deal in your walk and in your life. I mean, you do recognize that one day all of this stuff goes away. Every single thing, including Yeti cups and cell phones and the pew you're sitting on. The Bible tells us we were created for God forever. That's what we're living for. And so I think sometimes when you pause, you can prioritize that. All right, we've got to keep moving. If you listen fast, I will preach fast. Verse 24, they were facing exactly what Jesus expected. I know I've already talked about this, but when they went out there into that storm, Jesus wasn't surprised. He didn't come out and go, wow, the waves are really rocking. The wind is really blowing. And you do know that while none of us could have predicted 2020 ever, right? He knew. He knew 2020 was coming. He knew exactly what was going to go on. He knows what will happen tomorrow and the next day and forevermore. Look, we, we have to accept that we just don't understand God. That our human capacity to really get the fullness of who he is, we're too limited. But it doesn't change the truth that he knew. And if you begin to translate the things in your life because your eyes are locked on God, that God knew this was going to happen today. He could have had me avoid it. He could have had me go a different direction. He could have changed this. It doesn't mean that God is causing everything in your life because it pleases him to allow us to have free will and make choices. And sometimes people make a choice that affects you in a negative way. But if he wants to step in, he always can. If he wants to change it, he always can. And so your expectations can derail your faith Will your focus in your faith. If you expect something and it doesn't happen, the Bible says that hope deferred makes the heart sad. I'm not saying don't hope. I'm saying when your heart starts to get sad because what you hoped for didn't happen, recognize that God knew it wasn't going to happen and he's still there and he's still working. And even though some of those journeys are forever long, I was just talking to somebody this week uh, neither of us were talking about specifics, but uh, we were talking about something that's being prayed for and it hasn't happened yet. And literally they said to me, uh, well, I prayed for something for 30 years before it happened. And I immediately went, yeah, I prayed for something for 15 years until it happened. But it happened. God is in control. He is working and we need to manage our expectations. So verses 25 through 27, I want to read these to you again. Jesus, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. When the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Just let that sink in. When they saw Jesus, they were troubled. But we should never be troubled when we see Jesus, right? We should never be troubled when we enter his presence. We should never be troubled when someone brings up spiritual things to us at home, at work. Like that's not who he is. He didn't do it to scare them. It is a spirit, they cried out, for fear. Straightway Jesus spoke unto them and said, Be of good cheer, it is I. Be not afraid. Don't be afraid of what's going on. So Jesus is always on time. Right? Like like if you've ever seen the, the Tolkien movies, I really like The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings, and I like the world that J.R.R. Tolkien uh, created with that. And there's this line where, where one of the heroes of it is Gandalf, and, and Gandalf's a wizard, and he's talking to one of the hobbits, and he literally says to them, a wizard is always exactly where he means to be, when he means to be there. And that's that makeup thing for them, but it's absolute truth when it comes to God. I'm not that. This is a side note and it's free, so you can write it down if you want to, but I'm not going to charge you for this one. When you are late to something, you are robbing the people you're late with. Okay? So if you're habitually late, let it sink in and become a little more Christian in that area of your life. But I was late to a meeting this week by 15 minutes. And I wrote the people that I was coming to, hey, I'm really sorry, I'm going to be 15 minutes late. But in my mind, I still thought, you know what, they've prepared for it. They're going to be there when they said they were going to be there. And I'm sorry that I'm going to be late. I'm sorry that I'm robbing them of that time. I'm not saying it's not going to happen. Look, we're, we're all idiots because we were idiots when we were children. So I'm sorry if you didn't know that about yourself and I just insulted you. But we all blow it sometimes, right? Please be hyperly gracious and hyperly forgiving when someone is late on you. But we're all going to do it. And when you're the one that's doing it, just don't act like it doesn't matter. Don't think that because maybe you're the one uh, that everyone's meeting for. Don't think that because you're late for something for your kids, it doesn't matter because you're the parent. 
I mean, they're just the grubby kids. They wouldn't be alive without you, right? Well, none of you would be alive without God. Apologize to them. If you say you're going to do something at a certain time and you're late, it's not a big deal to say, you know what, I shouldn't have been late. Maybe you'll train in them a little bit of a good thing. If that was free, I'm going to jump back in. Jesus is always on time. How do you remind yourself who God is daily? I'm just asking, do you have some practice, some discipline, something in your life that every day you get to remind yourself of who God is? I mean, how would you keep your eyes locked on him otherwise? There's too much that's going to come your way. There's too much that Netflix is streaming. I mean, look, I'm not against Disney Plus. And I'm, I'm, I, we live in this world, right? We need to eat. We have times that we're going to need to zone out a little bit. But our greatest need will always be the, the, the connection we have with our Creator. And every single day in this world, you need to remind it, how am I, how, how am I ever going to promote the idea of doing good works and being loving in my world without my tether to God? There's too many people that could offend me too easily. I'm going to think the world deserves to go to hell. It doesn't. It does. Because we all do. It doesn't have to, and it doesn't deserve it any more than you do. And somewhere in where we need these daily reminders of who God is. And the other thing is, just check this. Your first response says something about your faith, but even more about your focus. Everyone gets scared if the doctor says you might have cancer. I don't think you should look at yourself and say, I'm a horrible Christian. I heard that word, and it scared me to death. Of course it did. But if your focus is on God, it won't last as long. You'll translate it differently, and, and, and your response will be different. And their first response to this storm, after every miracle Jesus has done, their response is, there's a ghost out on the water. Now, one of them was like, maybe it's Jesus. He's not with us. He does some pretty God-like things. They're so shocked by this miracle that they're like, you are the Son of God. Really? Took you to Matthew 14 to figure it out. Maybe they were all babies in their family. I don't know. I don't think that's true because James and John are brothers and they weren't twins. So they can't be the babies. So look at your first response. Get it figured out. Recognize in your life Jesus is over the winds. He's over the waves. He's over your fears. He's over COVID. He's over the economy. He's over disease, depression, disaster. You can see where I became a preacher, can't you? Disease, depression, disaster, divorce, difficulties. Alliteration, you just, it's a gift of the Spirit when you <laughs> surrender to become a preacher. He is over all that. I mean, he is over all that. All right, verse 28 and verse 29. I think this is great faith. Let's praise Peter, Peter for a second. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be now, then bid me to come unto thee on the water. And he said, Come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Before you fry Peter for his lack of faith, he's the only human being I know of that walked on water besides Jesus. And in this scene, he's the only disciple that got out of the boat. And his faith said, if it's really Jesus, I can do what he does. I can be like you. You've told me you've chosen me. You've told me I can follow you. You're my rabbi. I'm your disciple. If you're doing this, I can do it. And Peter walks on water. Are you doing anything in your life Anything that exhibits great faith like this. What are you stepping out of? What are you stepping onto for God, for Jesus in your life? Or is everything you're doing for Jesus on pause? I'll wait till the world gets better. You won't do anything else for the rest of your life. Somewhere we have to decide, God said we should be doing good works. That's just a Christian thing to do. That's what a Christ follower does. Somewhere we should be saying, I'm supposed to be full of love. People are supposed to know me because I'm a loving person. It's just what Jesus said for me to do. I'm supposed to encourage the people that are around me. Every phone call, every text, every email, all my communication, God expects me to be an encourager because of what he did in my life. Not because all the people around me deserve. You can be everything Jesus wants you to be. You can do everything Jesus wants you to do. Nothing is in the way of that. If you know him as your savior, then you can be everything Jesus wants you to be and you can do everything he wants you to do. But not from your couch. And not from your bed, to your bathroom, to work, back home, probably to the bathroom, back to bed, right? 
But while you're doing all of that stuff, he might do some incredible things for you at your work, while you're driving where you're going, while you're in your bathroom talking to the other people that are in your home for the day. I said I'd preach fast, but you had to listen fast, so I'm going to keep doing it. Verse 30, the Bible says this, but when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. Peter was. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. Uh, this, is, this is not what popped out to me, but, but it really, this is so important to get. When Peter began to sink, what did he do? He cried to Jesus. Do you think his lack of faith is in Jesus? Because when he's in trouble, who did he cry out to? He didn't say, hey, I can walk on water. He said, if it's you and you bid me to come on the water, I can do that. I don't believe his, his lack of faith or what Jesus is pointing out in his lack of faith. I think his lack of faith is in himself to be like Jesus. I got out of the water. I'm walking on the water. And if he had kept his eyes locked on Jesus, I think he'd have walked over to him and they'd have walked into the boat together. And this story would be written for a different purpose. But the Bible specifically tells us that his eyes went from Jesus. And look for a second. Look again at what it went to. But when he saw the wind boisterous, doesn't your mind think that he saw the waves? I've always thought he saw the waves. I don't know why. But I just assumed when he stepped out there, waves were blowing on him. And he felt the waves and he saw the waves. No, he looked at the wind, which is powerful, but you can't see it. The wind is one of the things that are, is often used as an analogy for God. That you can feel him, but you can't see him. Right? He took his eyes off of what he should have been focused on that was right there in front of him and he put his eyes on something else and it scared him. And so often when Christians hear God's voice say, do this, they get excited and they take a step to do it and then they look at the difficulty and then they look at the wind and then they look at themselves and how they're not good enough to do what Jesus asked them to do. Look, if we live our Christian life that way, no one can preach from this pulpit. That's right. I can't. No one can sing worship to God. You think you're holy enough to handle the word of God? It shouldn't even be in your hands. But in God, you're those things because he gave his son so that you can be righteous when you aren't righteous. That's what allows you to be what he wants you to be and do what he wants you to do. And Peter forgot that. And so will you and I when we take our eyes off of Jesus. We'll remember what we actually are. And what we are isn't good enough. So that's why we've got to keep our eyes locked on him. So Peter lost the lock. He lost the lock. He cries out to Jesus. I love this. Jesus let him splash but not sink. Like he went into the water, and I have this picture I love. this like Jesus reaching under the water to Peter. But the picture here really isn't that. The picture is that he started to sink. He might have been knee deep by the time Jesus grabbed him and pulled him back up. I don't know how far he got. He made a bit of a splash, but he didn't let him sink. And Jesus won't let you sink. If you try to do something for him, it might not work out the way you think it's going to work out, but he's not going to let you sink. You say, well, I did that once and I got hurt. I bet he's working to heal you. Because I've done some stuff for God and, and it brought me great hurt. And he's worked on me to help me heal. I mean, that's a part of it. It's not a fun part of it at all. I have the utmost sympathy and compassion for you if you've gone through that. It's hard to face spiritual hurt, isn't it? But he is over spiritual hurt. He is over anything and everything you've gotten. And in him, you can be everything that he wants you to be. And Peter forgot it. He lost the lock. And even then, Jesus reached out and grabbed him. You know what I've done? I'm going to say this slow. I mean, I've been preaching fast, so I'm going to slow down. What do you think I would have done? What would you? I mean, I, you should be asking what you've done, but you might be nicer than me. Peter is going to tell Jesus not to go to the cross. And then he's going to deny him three times. Jesus knows that. He knows it's coming. Jesus is going to say to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Right? That's the dude sinking. Just let him gurgle a little. You know? <laughs> just a little. little lake. Filth in his mouth. He just a little. So that he would remember it. Every time that taste came back to him, he'd remember. That's not. The second Peter cries out for Jesus, Jesus is there for him. The second you cry out to Jesus, he won't end your storm. He won't fix everything you need fixed. The second you cry out to him, he will be there for you. And without the alone time, you'll never know that. I'm going to go back to preaching fast. So in verse 31, Jesus let him splash but not sink. In verse 32, Peter got to walk on the water again with Jesus. 
They're not in the boat when Jesus grabs them and Jesus doesn't throw them in the boat. Because Peter was willing to step out on faith. He experienced Jesus in a way that none of the other apostles did. Like, like just be honest. If you were in that boat, wouldn't you go with Jesus? Now that you know the story and what's going on, I go. I can swim. I mean, I go. And if I sank, if I looked at the wind, if something happened in my faith and I sank in the water, I'd grab to Jesus. I would love to have walked on water with Jesus. I hope we still get to do that. Peter did. He walked a bit by himself. Started to sink, made a splash, didn't sink, got to walk back into the boat with Jesus. Got to walk on the water. The life of faith is your best life. It is also the life that you will produce the most ripples with. It is not your easiest life. It isn't your easiest life. And somewhere along the lines, we as Christians have to make a very fundamental choice. Do I live for this world? I want the easiest and happiest life I can have in now. <coughs> Or do I really believe what Jesus said about heaven? And that I shouldn't look for my greatest life now. I should live in faith for God. Taking every storm he wants to bring in my life. Because the life that's coming is the life that I should be living for. But the Bible makes no secret of the fact that Jesus is going to rule and reign on this earth for a thousand years. And everyone who knows Christ as Savior will be able to rule and reign with him during that time. It doesn't even say, I mean, he will be ruling over us, but it uses the word with him. And then there's forever, where the Bible literally says, you will forever be with God. He will forever be our God. We will forever be his people. If you've ever had one of those worries about, what if I get to heaven and I messed up like Lucifer did? What if I lose it somehow? What if I get there and it's not great? God who made this world and everything you love about this world is remaking this world. And that's where you get to live forever. And he is remaking the heavens, and I think we'll get to explore it. But, but that's who you're talking about. You love trees, you love flowers, you love wind, you love water, you love heat, you love sun, you love food. What is it you love? God made all that the first time around. You're experiencing it in a fallen way, and forever you get to live and experience it. I think that life is, there's no way it won't be the better life. And I think the Bible I read tells me that that's where I should try to lay up treasure. Why would it tell me to do that if there wasn't treasure that you could lay up in heaven? Are we just going to cast all your crowns before Jesus' feet? Wrong. That's like a very select group of 24 people that do that. The Bible doesn't say that you're going to do that. Jesus said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. He says when he comes back to get us, his reward will be with him. Literally says that about the rapture. His reward will be with him. Look, I don't know what all that stuff is. I just know that this life can't compare to that life. Amen. Momentary suffering. Yeah, 40 years of suffering is momentary suffering. Trust me, I know something about it. I haven't gotten 40 years, but I do know something about it. And if you're in it for the long haul, there's a day coming where it will end and it will stop. And you'll either have made good ripples or you have made bad ripples. There's no way you can't jump in. You're going to jump in. You're going to be in contact with other people. And I look at this story of Peter with just a different view now. I look at it and I think, man, dude, if you could have just kept your eyes locked on Jesus, you wouldn't have sank. And so he doesn't have that opportunity anymore. Peter did a lot of great things and a lot of not so great things after this. But he definitely created ripples that are still moving in our world today for Jesus. And that's all I'm trying to challenge you to do. I'm trying to provoke you to love, to provoke you to good works, and to encourage you. And so much more as we see that day approaching. Would you stand on your feet with your heads bowed and your eyes closed this morning? And if everyone would bow their heads and close their eyes just out of respect for everyone else. I feel it's really important to have a time of invitation. While we're not inviting people to come up here to the altar, uh, we're not there yet.